some of the recurring conditions of vulnerability to disasters, migrants, farm workers, the specific focus on undocumented indigenous issues. The panel includes perspectives from academia, migrants' rights organizations, including organized indigenous migrants, and California Office of Emergency Service, and in particular, uh, California Listos, California Campaign. We will attempt identifying measures that can help improve communication, outreach, and systems to migrants at risk and affected by disasters, and support their engagement in disaster management for the benefit of the whole community. As we know, the pandemic has exacerbated existing vulnerabilities. Crisis reveal the vulnerabilities that exist in society. Migrants facing marginalization empowerment, lack of representation in normal times, often end up being amongst the people worst affected in times of disaster. We are seeing this clearly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Vulnerable migrants have gone unaccounted for in public health and welfare efforts and are now struggling to recover from the direct and indirect impact of the pandemic. Our inability to design Migrant inclusive efforts has undermined our collective capacity to control and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. All over the world, countries are struggling to prevent and manage outbreaks in places in which migrants live, work, or transit. The last months have shown us how fragile can be the societies that do not manage to protect their most vulnerable members. The pandemic, however, like perhaps no other crisis in the past, has also revealed the crucial role that migrants play in supporting the resilience of our globalized, interconnected society. All around the world, communities have found themselves relying on migrant workers in key sectors such as healthcare and medical research, food production, distribution, logistics, and transportation, just to mention a few critical services. COVID-19 has reminded us that migrant workers, including those employed in lowly skilled jobs, the undocumented ones, and those living in situations of marginalization and exclusion, contribute to our societies in a myriad of ways. Faced with COVID-19, many countries have rushed reforms to facilitate migrants' access to health care, housing, welfare benefits, and regular migration status. Portugal, for instance, has launched a temporary regularization scheme. The U.S. has declared farm workers, including undocumented migrants, essential. Malaysia has made its healthcare services more accessible. Singapore has improved the condition of its workers' accommodation. While positive evolutions and key to controlling the spread of the pandemic, all these interventions are stark reminders of the conditions of acute marginalization that are experienced daily by many migrants worldwide. Same trend existed before the pandemic. In fact, this is not the first time that we are confronted with the paradox of the extreme vulnerability of so many essential members of our society. COVID-19 is just one, not even the last anymore of a series of disasters and crises worldwide that have disproportionately affected migrants. Just to remain within our national boundaries, one only needs to think about the fires and earthquakes that have affected California over the last couple of decades, Hurricanes Harvey, Sandy, Katrina, and all the way back to the 1987 Saragossa tornado. These are all well-documented instances of disasters hitting migrant communities particularly hard. In zooming out, even more examples come to mind. Hurricane Dorian hit in the Bahamas just over one year ago, the Tohoku Triple Disaster, and the floods in Thailand in 2011, and even the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. In all these instances, we have seen communication barriers, lack of access to essential services, isolation and lack of trust in response actors becoming obstacles for migrants to accessing essential information and assistance. 
and to protecting themselves and others. This is a truly global concern, taking an in-depth look at how migrants, governmental and non-governmental actors have engaged in risk reduction efforts in the context of wildfires in California and teach us valuable lessons to address current and future crises all around the world. Let me just conclude with a final word on the UN, uh, MIKIC, and partnerships. The International Organization for Migration has been at the forefront of the promotion of this talk and efforts globally. Through its engagement in the US funded Migrants in Countries in Crisis Initiative, which we call MIKIC in short, and through the implementation of the resulting guidelines. Among the key lessons that we have learned working on this topic, over the last years, the need for strong partnerships stands out. Governments have the primary responsibility to protect all affected persons in disasters, but inclusive risk reduction and emergency management systems rely on strong coordination among all relevant actors, governmental and non-governmental, and in our case, international as well. I'm therefore particularly pleased to welcome today such a diverse panel of speakers in such a diverse audience, community representatives, civil society organizations, employers and private sector actors, academics, and government institutions, all have key knowledge, capacities, and resources that need to be leveraged in order to provide appropriate opportunities and assistance to all people at risk. I want to thank the colleagues from the Mixteco Indigenous Community Organization, COLS, the University of California at Irvine, California's Office of Emergency Support, and for their commitment to this event. It's a pleasure for us at the UN to be able to convene this webinar, and we intend to leverage it to support experience sharing and evidence-based advocacy, policies, and programs in all regions. In conclusion, our experience with the implementation of the MIKI guidelines also shows that all risk reduction and emergency management measures that include migrants need to be supported by efforts to reverse the root causes of migrant marginalization and vulnerability. We need to ensure that the rights of all migrants are respected and that they have sufficient access to services, housing, employment opportunities, and participation in community life. We need to prevent and counter xenophobia and discrimination. We need to ensure migrants have pathways of safe and regular migration. Crisis provide us with a learning opportunity, and we are truly grateful to all our partners who have been taken the time to reflect with us on their practices and experiences. As we look to building back our communities, we need to leverage today's lessons to promote decisive, long-lasting change that helps us achieve more inclusive, more just and more resilient society. I want to thank you for, for your attention, and, and now let me call on stage my colleague, Lorenzo Badagno, from my IOM headquarters in Geneva, who manages the MIT initiative and will be moderating this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, and I will introduce you the So sorry, um, I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, you bit it out. Could you please uh, allow me to share my screen? Thank you. It, uh, good, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning for the uh, people in the United States. It's such an honor to be here today to present our research on uh, undocumented migrants and impacts from disasters such as wildfire and COVID-19. Um, it is a true honor to um, present this information and show what is happening uh, to mig migrant communities here in California and the United States and what lessons we can learn from more di inclusive disaster planning. 
Thank you for the opportunity. Let me share my screen. Great. Um, as many of you know, as mentioned, um, and thank you, Luca, for that great uh, overview and context of disasters both in the United States and globally, and the need for more um, uh, assistance for migrant communities uh, during disasters. Uh, as it was mentioned before, in California, we are experiencing a major climate change crisis. Uh, in the last uh, eight weeks, millions of people have been impacted by the fires, blackouts, heat waves, and the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic and of course, the loss of property and life. These are major life events. Currently, three of the 10 largest wildfires by acreage in the state are currently burning. Uh, these compounding of disasters have a corresponding cascading health, social, and economic impacts on people, especially people of color, such as, such as African Americans and Latinos and indigenous communities. Uh, in the state, we are experiencing multiple weeks of an unhealthy air quality or worse. Um, this unhealthy air quality has been so dramatic that's affecting the globe, and much of the wildfire smoke because of increasing jet streams across the United States has reached Europe, as we can see from the map here. So the implication of this climate crisis in California has global implications, particularly on socially vulnerable populations. As uh, Luca, uh, uh, Luca mentioned earlier, disaster risk reduction starts with social integration of migrants. Uh, disaster planning and resources are a basic human right, and we need to provide human dignity and opportunities to integrate uh, migrants into disaster planning, recovery, and response. And acknowledging that uh, because of the pre-disaster marginalized status of undocumented migrants in, uh, in the United States and globally, they require special consideration in disaster planning, response, and recovery. Our presentation today uh, will discuss the, uh, the community's hardest hit on extreme wildfires and COVID-19. We examine a case study of the 2017 and 18 Thomas Fire in Ventura County and Santa Barbara counties. These counties are about 60 miles northwest of uh, downtown Los Angeles. Um, and we highlight uh, how uh, stakeholders, particularly uh, migrant rights organizations, collaborated to develop new strategies in the context of climate change and inequality. We will further analyze how to create an inclusive process of disaster prevention, outreach, and climate adaptation planning. We recently published our results in GeoForum, which is one of the, the top leading uh, human geography journals um, in, um, uh, globally, um, and if you would like to see uh, these results, uh, this uh, this article is open access and free, available online. So a, a brief roadmap of what we'll be covering. I'll be covering understanding wildfire and, and inequality, um, and an overview of the Thomas wildfire and impacts on documented immigrants, their demographics. Then Genevieve uh, Flotis Hoppo and Lucas uh, Zucker will dis discuss the specific disaster impacts from the Thomas wildfire and implication for the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'll end with broader policy uh, implications, very high level policy implications. And during the Q&A, hopefully we'll have time to discuss specific prescriptive policy recommendations. According to a recent proceedings of the National Academies, climate change is making wildfire season longer and more severe in the Western United States. On average, wildfires in the western United States burn six times the acreage they did 45 years ago. In California, Sierra Nevada, the frequency of wildfires since 1970 has increased 250% as the mountain snowpack melts earlier and the fire season extends year-round. Moreover, 15 of the 20 largest wildfires by acreage in California have occurred since 2000. And this graph from uh, Cal Fire, the, the state agency that handles fires throughout the state, is from July 20th. And you see when we, uh, in, in July 20th, the Thomas Fire, our case study, was the second largest wildfire um, in California's history. But then if we look at a recent updated um, uh, statistics from last month, we see because of the recent wildfires, the Thomas Fire has been pushed down to the sixth largest a wildfire in California's uh, history. So 17 of the 20 largest wildfires recorded in California since 1932 now have been in the last 20 years. While uh, climate scientists expect fires to become more frequent and severe, it is important to explore how some people and communities are more affected by these events than others. 
Differences in human vulnerability to wildfire stem from the range of social, economic, historical, and political factors. These factors include access to disaster preparedness knowledge and resources, contrasting legacies of forest management practices, and the expansion of residential development into the wildland. Research at the uh, University of Washington recently analyzed the unequal vulnerability of wildfires to communities of color. They use a socio-ecological approach to determine wildfire vulnerability across 70 uh, census tracts in the United States. This first map here shows wildfire hazard potential as determined by the U.S. Forest, sense, uh, forest Service by census tract. Here we see that 29 people spread out through the United States are vulnerable uh, to wildfire hazard. And this only looks at proximity to a wildfire hazard risk. It does not look at socioeconomic uh, or demographics. This second map, however, uh, takes into account both landscape wildfire risk and socioeconomic factors to determine how likely an area is to adapt to and recover from a wildfire. They measure it by using data from 2014 census on race, income, language, education, housing, and other factors. The researchers find that communities of color, specifically those census tracts with the majority Black, Latino, or Native American, are 50% more vulnerable to wildfires compared to other census tracts. This research shows that the majority of the 29 million people who live in areas with significant chance of extreme wildfires are white and socially, socially economically secure. Traditional analyses often obscure the fact that Black, Latino, Indigenous people have worse prospects for recovery from wildfire. In California, while many, many fire-prone places are largely populated by higher-income people, uh, they also include hundreds of thousands of low-income individuals who lack the resources to prepare or recover from fire. These numbers will likely surge according to the California Earth Assessment Report, which uh, projects that the California's wildfire burn area will increase by 77% by the end of the century. The state of California, until recently, has not uh, analyzed uh, wildfire uh, vulnerability based on social vulnerability. For example, in the University of Washington map, um, identifying those that are most socially vulnerable is important because in this map, we see that California's rural low-income and immigrant communities, residents often do not have the required resources to pay for insurance, rebuild or invest in fire safety, which increases their vulnerability to wildfire. So this, uh, this initial social vulnerability map actually does not show um, high levels of social vulnerability in our case study area because many of the people that are socially vulnerable in our coastal region of Santa Barbara and Ventura are undocumented uh, migrants and they're undercounted in the census. So using social vulnerability uh, mapping techniques that solely relies on census data will obscure or render invisible uh, undocumented migrant communities. Such outcomes occurring um, during and after wildfires have major environmental justice implications and in that certain populations due to their socioeconomic status must live with a disproportionate share of environmental impacts and suffer the related public health and quality of life burdens. In a few minutes, uh, Lucas and Genevieve will discuss the specific impacts of the Thomas wildfire, but I want to provide a context of the Thomas wildfire itself. Uh, on December 4, 2017, the Thomas Fire started north of the city of Santa Paula in Ventura County. It grew quickly to nearly 30, 31,000 acres, 50 square miles in less than 12 hours. Its explosive growth was driven by a combination of climatic events, including dry foliage, low humidity, and intense Santa Ana winds that gusted up to 60 miles per hour. At the time of final containment on January 20th, 2018, 40 days later, the Thomas Fire would be classified at the time as the second largest wildfire in California's history. The fire affected hundreds of thousands of residents in the counties of Ventura and Barbara. The blackouts, the destruction of over a thousand buildings, and the fatality of one firefighter. Media outlets across the country focused on news reports on the loss of coastal and land hillside mansions and impacts to wealthy homeowners and farmers. The Thomas Fire, however, not only destroyed expensive property and crops, but also endangered the health and livelihood of thousands of undocumented immigrants. California's home to an estimated uh, 2.5 million undocumented immigrants, many of whom are farm workers or are employed in service jobs such as housekeeping and landscaping. In Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, undocumented in individuals are estimated to account for more than 9% of the population or 111,000 people. 
and there's a high level of racial and economic inequality and political and uh, lack of political and economic inclusion. Uh, while relief efforts in the Thomas Fire have largely have been placed praise of the fact that immigrant workers were especially impacted from the fire due to the loss of employment, the lack of evacuation information in their native language, confusion about eligibility for relief services, and poor infrastructure and housing in immigrant communities. Undocumented immigrants' socioeconomic situation is usually precarious. However, the wildfire and, uh, disaster intensified their already difficult situation. The Thomas Fire revealed how undocumented migrants and those with seasonal work visas require special consideration in disaster planning. These individuals are often afraid to seek help and restitution during and after a wildfire or fear of deportation. Undocumented uh, migrants are also unable to access disaster relief services because of language barriers and prohibition from accessing federal disaster assistance funds. Governments in the region overlooked the needs of low-income um, workers, Spanish and indigenous Mixteco speakers and immigrant families. Ventura and Santa Barbara counties are both home to a growing indigenous Mexican population. It is estimated that over 25,000 indigenous Oaxacan people from southern Mexico live and work in Ventura County, while Santa Barbara is home to a population estimated at 29,000. Concentrated in labor-intensive sectors such as row crops and cut flowers, indigenous migrants perform an increasing amount of the arduous labor which con contributes to the profitability and affordability of fresh fruits and vegetables. In particular, Mistex people in Ventura County are culturally and linguistically isolated. Many are illiterate and most speak neither Spanish nor English, but only their native a language Misteco. It is important to note that Mistex people are not Hispanic or Latino, but are indigenous. They often are homogenized with uh, other Latino uh, populations. The fact that they often cannot communicate with people beyond their own indigenous community impedes their ability to obtain appropriate health care, housing, education, negotiation, uh, negotiate with their employers to improve the work situation and exercise their basic civil rights. With these variables in mind, our research adapts the work in the field of public health that examines in issues of intersectionality, that is, how social categories of gender, class, race, ingenuity, immigration status, and other aspects of human identity intersect with wildfire. The concept of intersectionality has been used to highlight how these categories of culture and identity overlap, hiding the effects of discrimination, exclusion, social inequality, and systemic injustice in lives of specific in individuals. An intersectional approach to wildfire disaster emphasizes how certain people and groups suffer worse effects because of overlapping factors that are often measured separately. In this respect, we define vulnerability to wildfires comprised of the risk of exposure, the likelihood that people will be affected, sensitivity, the degree to which people are affected, and adaptive capacity, the ability of people to prepare for and recover from the wildfire based on available resources. And finally, we ask the question, what does adaptive capacity mean for migrant communities? Most of the literature on adaptive communities of wildfires focuses on redesigning communities, hard assets, the built environment, such as homes and buildings, through land use and building codes. But what does this mean in terms of language access, worker health and safety rights for migrants, immigration status and access to disaster relief, and impacts to housing and transportation after and during a disaster? So now uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Genevieve uh, from MICUP, who will discuss the specific aspects. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for for the space to to share with you. Um, one, you know, this this article that we co-authored with Dr. Mendez, and and two, just our, our lived experience um, as people who are on the ground going through it in 2017 and 2018. Um, really quickly, it's been interesting just because of the consistent wildfires. You know, this picture was taken um, during, uh, actually, I think it was the 2018 Wolseley fire. We've already just had consistent wildfires um, the last three years. And it's been interesting because with these current wildfires that Dr. Mendez outlined, this picture's been popping up as, you know, farm workers laboring up in Northern California during these current fires when really, you know, it's, it's another fire from a different region, different year. Um, it just goes to show just how impacted the state of California has been um, due to uh, wildfire events. Um, next slide, please. 
So part of the work that um, our organization did uh, during the Thomas fire was to provide language access to emergency information. For the first 10 days of the Thomas fire, all emergency um, announcements were in English only. English only. Um, and so that includes road closures, that includes school closures, evacuation areas, um, water advisories, uh, et cetera. And so in specifically in Ventura County, a third of the population speaks Spanish, um, and that's not inclusive of the population that my organization, my cop works with, which are indigenous migrant speakers. And so, again, for those first 10 days, it was our organization putting out that information in Spanish, in Mixteco, in Zapoteco, um, and then on the back end, really working with our, our board of supervisors um, and our state and local uh, elected representatives to, to push to have the, the information put in, in the appropriate languages. Um, at some one point, we got a Google Translate bar added to the emergency website, um, and the, the translation was so poor, it was translating a wild brush fire into hairbrush fire. Um, so, again, in English, it's wild brush fire. It was putting it in Spanish as hairbrush fire. And uh, if you don't understand the context, if you don't know what's going on, it, it definitely makes the situation harder to understand. Um, next slide, please. And so, again, part of the work that we do at my organization is within um, language justice, language access. Um, and again, a lot of that information wasn't getting to our community members, and so it was up to us to do that. Um, in particular, indigenous languages are, are oral, um, and there's different variants within those indigenous languages. So for us, it was crucial to make sure that we provided the information in a way that our community was going to understand it best. Um, I, I'll give you an example that's COVID related, for example, because these languages are over 3,000 years old, a lot of the terminologies don't exist. So, for example, if we think about COVID-19, if you're trying to explain that as a virus, there's no word for that in Misteco. Um, and so what our community has to do or what our, our team has to do is find the word or find the description that best arrives the closest to the word virus. It could be sickness. It could be symptoms. Um, so the same was done during the wildfires. Um, just in terms of air quality, in terms of what are your workplace rights. And um, Professor Mendez, if you could please just play an example of, of Misteco. It, in another presentation, these are videos. Um, these are videos that we put out um, via our social media following. We have our local page for the organization. We have a radio station page. In between the two, we've got about 16, 18,000 followers. So we're able to get out information quickly through these channels. Um, so just really, really briefly, please, Dr. Mendez. So as you can see from that example, it, these languages are completely unlike Spanish, completely unlike English, um, they're tonal languages, um, and, and again, it's, it's crucial to, to, to get as close of a variant as you can to, to, to get the information out as quickly as possible, especially during, during a disaster. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this was uh, the air quality um, five days after the wildfire. Um, and so you can see um, near the burn zones, the, the purple, how poor the air quality was. Um, but if you look at the red, uh, you see the cities of Santa Paula, Oxnard, Camarillo, um, those are the cities where a lot of our community members work in agriculture. Um, for Ventura County, the agriculture industry is about a $2 billion industry, um, and it's where our, our, our community members predominantly work. And unfortunately, um, because they weren't getting as quick access to information, a lot of folks didn't realize that there even was a wildfire going on. They didn't realize how poor their quality was, and they continued working in the agriculture fields without proper protection. Um, the, picture, I guess, in the intro for myself and Lucas, it's a picture of me. I had a meeting with uh, one of our healthcare systems, and I was just driving through uh, the city of Oxnard seeing uh, workers, and they had, um, they didn't have masks. So, you know, getting out, getting in the field, that was a celery field, and handing out the N95 masks. Um, and so, and so that was, that was our work. You know, I was out there, Lucas was out there, we had our, our, our staff, volunteers, um, just again, trying to get out the safety equipment to, to the workers because of how poor the air quality was and, and just informing them like, hey, it's, it's pretty bad out here. Um, 
And so unfortunately for our workers, you know, there's not the opportunity to do well, you know, I've asked my money to stay home. It's an economic issue. Our, our farm workers, even though they're picking the luxury crops of strawberries, avocados, um, you know, citrus, they're only making 15 to $20,000 a year. Um, and, and most of them can't even afford the, to purchase the fruit that they're, they're picking themselves. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, so here is um, a map and you can see that the area in the pink um, are areas where the the fire um, had impacted the water. Um, basically where the water there wasn't put like, you couldn't drink the water. So it was a recommendation by the city of Ventura actually to boil the water. Um, and the city of Ventura, tying it back to the language access piece, um, they put out a statement, a press release, but the first two uh, lines of the press release were in Spanish. And it basically said, you know, um, make sure you understand this or have someone explain it to you. And then it goes into English on how you needed to boil, boil your water before you drink it. Um, and if you see this strip of pink, um, that's an area in Ventura known as the Avenue. Um, and it's where a lot of our uh, lower income, working class, people of color communities, um, again, most Spanish speakers uh, live, so they weren't getting this crucial information that could impact their health. Um, next slide, please. And so, um, and work, worker and health, no, oh, this is still me. Um, and so just really quickly on health and safety impacts, already farm worker communities um, high, have higher instances of respiratory issues, whether it's from the dust, um, because the fields, um, you know, they, there's a lot of dust on the fields, or if it's from pesticide exposure. So they're already, they already have those pre-existing conditions. You, you compound that with poor air quality, and a lot of our community members, um, you know, were developing pneumonia, they were developing, uh, if they didn't have asthma before, they had it now. Um, and so there was a real impact to their health just because they couldn't stay home and 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 not work. Um, there's the the double-edged sword that I believe Lucas will get into of where, okay, if they if they're sent home, a lot of our folks got sent home, but then there's an economic impact to that because they weren't given um, they weren't paid to be sent home. It was basically that they're being sent home for their safety, but it's, it was unpaid, and and that definitely impacted them as well. Um, but yeah, so that was a lot of what we saw uh, during the Thomas fire is is these re residual healthcare issues. We we had one community member actually who he got sick because of the fire. Um, I believe it was he had pneumonia and he couldn't he couldn't work. He was basically out of work, couldn't go back, and he decided to just go mm -hmm. back home to his hometown, his pueblo in Mexico. Um, so these are just again real impacts that when you think about wildfires, you think more about the housing loss, you think more about like the people who who lost their homes, but there are these secondary impacts um, that definitely go under the radar for for a lot of these major events. Um, next, please. And so here we have direct quotes um, from some of the farm workers that we worked with, um, and you can see, you know, the, the first uh, farm worker three days without the mask. Um, like we mentioned, a lot of the the companies weren't providing them. Um, there were headaches, watery eyes, a cough. Um, and then they weren't given masks until the city came out to regulate. They had someone had to tell the employer to provide masks. And in the second quote, quote, you can see from another farm worker that their whole crew got sick, that the throats were closed, um, the kids couldn't go to school. Um, and a lot of them ended up having to buy their own protective uh, gear, their own masks, their own goggles. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And I will leave this to Lucas. Thank you. Here, pause. Um, and I think, as, as Genevieve spoke to, a lot of the health consequences for workers, uh, particularly immigrant workers in, in California during wildfires, are really driven by uh, economic necessity to work uh, during dangerous conditions because of a lack of access to the safety net. So, for farm workers, particularly a majority of farm workers are undocumented. Um, undocumented workers uh, in California throughout the United States are excluded from unemployment assistance, uh, as well as other forms of disaster aid like, like FEMA assistance. Um, and typical pay is often on uh, piece, piece rate pay. So, a worker might be paid uh, $2 per box of strawberries that they pick. Um, 
it's like a large flat, not not uh, you know like a, a little clamshell box. Um, and particularly with the high cost of living uh, in in coastal California and the, the Central Coast region, um, a lot of immigrant workers are already living you know on the on the financial edge and can't afford to lose even a few weeks of work. Um, as Jenny mentioned, there's often this this double-edged sword where there will be a surge of work, um, and uh, initially because uh, companies want to harvest their crops, prevent them from, prevent them from being damaged by smoke and ash, um, and then afterwards will send workers home. And um, for you know, in the, during the Thomas fire, the smoke conditions lasted for about a month, and so there were there were weeks where people were out of work. Um, so for for I think this raises a broader point that for workers whose livelihoods depend on the land uh, and working conditions outdoors, uh, their their uh, economic survival will continue to be heavily impacted by climate disruptions. Next slide, please. So here you can see um, some of the examples of uh, further further kind of impacts and testimonies for workers. Um, this also brings in not just uh, the impact to, to farm workers, uh, but also to some of the domestic workers, housekeepers, landscapers, um, who do service work in some of the wealthy areas uh, around Santa Barbara um, that were hit not just by the, uh, the wildfire, but later by the debris flow, the mudslides that occurred um, uh, when the rains hit. Um, and carried a lot of that land downward uh, that, that was no longer held in place by vegetation that had been burned. Um, and so we saw a, a series of impacts there for both farm workers and, and domestic workers. Next slide, please. And so, so particularly with uh, domestic workers, um, you know, this is this is often kind of, you know, it's it's um, you know more informal work often, right? Um, you know, often often paid cash, um, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, without kind of more formal employment contracts. Um, and uh, often the wealthy areas of the region uh, where there are these large homes on the hillsides were both in the, you know, major fire evacuation zones as well as the mudslide zones afterwards. Um, and so these are, these affluent areas, there are, there are few immigrant workers who live there, um, but so many work there. And that gets to some of the challenge of, a lot of our climate adaptation strategies are based on, you know, mapping census tracts that we consider vulnerable to natural disasters. There are often many people who don't live in those census tracts who are extremely vulnerable populations, um, but who every day during the day work there, are exposed to health hazards from working there, um, and are uh, at much greater exposure to some of the economic impacts. Um, so what you often saw was, was wealthy families who live in some of these evacuation areas um, were able to simply pack up and move somewhere else, you know, stay in a, in a short-term rental, Airbnb, um, stay with a family member, or maybe even out of state, you know, and, and simply wait out until the till the disaster was over. Uh, many of these workers, not so much. Um, folks who who both, you know, have have uh, you know economic and other barriers to evacuating, um, but also really cannot afford to lose that work that they depend on, um, you know, in housekeeping, landscaping, caregiving, uh, gardening. Um, in, in some of those homes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, so uh, another major uh, area of, of impact uh, is in the service economy. Um, the turn Santa Barbara County is, uh, particularly Santa Barbara area, has a large uh, hospitality and tourism industry, um, which really saw almost a complete shutdown during the natural disaster. No one wants to, you know, take their beautiful Santa Barbara vacation um, when the, the, the place is on fire. And so uh, a lot of the immigrant workers are what you call back of the house workers, um, folks who are uh, really in jobs that have been invisibilized, uh, uh, dishwashers, line cooks, uh, you know, in, in restaurants, uh, hotel housekeepers uh, who, who lost uh, weeks of work as well. And so this really, uh, what you see is domestic workers, uh, hospitality workers, farm workers, of all of these industries that were most heavily impacted uh, by fire and natural disaster are also the industries um, that most heavily depend on immigrant low wage workers uh, for their for their uh, workforces. Um, and so part of the the issue is this policy choice that we've made as a country. Um, we have a you know we are essentially you know and now you see this during COVID nineteen where we're saying oh these are essential workers many of these immigrant workers um, but 
as a society, we're, we're saying that their labor is essential, but the survival of their families is not essential. Um, and so we don't provide unemployment insurance. We don't provide a safety net um, to, to folks whose, whose work that we, we depend on. But if they're not working, um, it's, it's work or starve. And so the, the 805 on DocuFund, um, to meet that policy void, was created by uh, my cop, uh, cause and then a third organization, uh, FLA, in, in the region, um, three immigrant serving organizations that raised over $2 million to distribute to um, uh, about 1,600 families um, who uh, applied for that uh, aid. Uh, this was a model that we replicated from uh, from another part of California, Northern California, that had, had first experienced a wildfire and created on a DocuFund. Now it's been re- replicated in many places all over the state uh, to, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I think the big challenge here is that we are not government. We were able to um, do a significant amount of, of fundraising, uh, but this really took a long time and it was very difficult. Uh, it was largely volunteer run clinics. Um, many workers had to wait a long time to get, get aid. Um, and so we saw this even more in, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic where five times as many people as we helped during the Thomas fire uh, applied within just the first couple weeks of the, of the pandemic. Um, and we really saw that the, a kind of you know, charitable approach is not adequate to replace policy change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's here's a, a testimony from a worker, um, uh, you know, who was served by the 805 Andaki Fund. Next slide, please. Uh, two other uh, you know, impacts to talk about. Um, one is the loss of regional housing stock. Uh, you know, it's already an area with, with a limited supply of affordable housing. Um, but now you saw a lot of these high income homeowners who had lost their homes, um, with insurance checks of, you know, four or five thousand dollars a month, um, competing with low wage renters for the available affordable rental stock. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then the, the final impact is the 101 freeway is the only way essentially in and out of the uh, community of Santa Barbara, which is surrounded by mountains and ocean on either side. Um, that freeway was uh, really demolished by the mudslide. Um, and people, in order to get to work, who live in more affordable areas of the, of the region, um, had to do things like take long distance commuter trains, uh, travel all the way around the other side of the mountain, uh, you know, or, um, or simply not lose their, lose their work altogether. Um, and so we, we also see the way the housing and transportation uh, systems intersect with this. Um, so I think so I'll pass it back to, um, to Dr. Mendes. Uh, an interest of time, I'll skip over some of these slides, but uh, uh, Lucas and Jenny, we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A about the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Essentially, had it not been for the organizing of uh, social organizations, migrant rights groups, um, in the area, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, while it's, it has large implications for migrant communities, would have been far worse. So within the three years of the Thomas Spire, this strong uh, social infrastructure has been um, developed in the Central Coast area where migrant rights organizations are now considered disaster experts in their own right and slowly are becoming um, invited to government organization, government meetings and disaster planning to uh, provide more uh, inclusive disaster planning. But we can talk a little bit more about that project. But the Thomas Fire did set up a social infrastructure to help um, pressure uh, local and state government to be more, more inclusive of um, undocumented migrants, both indigenous and Latino. And as uh, Thomas, uh, as uh, Lucas mentioned, there's strong uh, implications and limits of vulnerability mapping or a disaster. Um, how we uh, define who we're going to serve, um, and there's a lot of secondary impacts uh, of the, to migrant communities. And then, so thinking beyond property values. So uh, the final policy implication that there is no social uh, safety net, uh, and that we need to understand the disaster risk reduction starts with social integration, disaster resources and planning should be a basic human right afforded to these essential workers, these essential people of our society. And acknowledging that existing in, uh, inequalities are only exasperated during the disaster, and political choices are being made about withholding important planning and uh, recover resources from these migrant communities, and they're rendered invisible because of uh, cultural norms of U.S citizenship and issues of racism that uh, decide who is a worthy disaster victim. 
And then finally, broader on um, policy implications in, to ensure uh, inclusive disaster planning, draw on immigrant community knowledge, that lived experience. Uh, Genevieve and Lucas are disaster experts in their own right now. Uh, we need to embrace immigrant communities and uh, disaster planning, response and recovery. And then finally, um, while civil society and plays an important role, they do not take the place of government. So important to not only bolster civil society, but also bolster uh, the funding for a government to reach out to these communities. And then finally, I'd like to put, put a little um, uh, info here. If you want to learn more about California's climate change impacts and inequality, um, my book, Climate Change from the Streets through Yale University Press, really talks about the history of climate change impacts and how environmental justice and people of color have been changing the, uh, the policy in California and globally. So we'll cover more of a prospective policy uh, implications and uh, recommendations and our uh, doing it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, Lucas, and Genevieve for uh, this presentation. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how the vulnerability that you were describing really is multifaceted. It goes from lack of uh, inclusion in risk assessments, lack of awareness of the system about the presence of the people to community uh, that cannot have access to the same level of information and the same level of, of preparedness therefore. Um, and then down to mobility restrictions, um, the, the type of indirect impacts that show throughout the recovery phase. And it was really interesting to see how kind of hazard independent all of these is. You, you, you were, Lucas in particular was mentioning the, the, the debris flow uh, and the fires alongside each other. And then you have COVID coming in. And, and, and I'm thinking now about the situation that just happened with Hurricane Delta in Cancun that's affecting an area where there is a high concentration of foreign workers in the tourism sector as well. And, and um, we are likely to see similar uh, issues at play there too. So, and, and all these I think leads uh, really nicely to the next presentation, which is more about some of the solutions perhaps that can be, um, can, that can be leveraged um, in particular from the, the, the public sector, from, from the government side, um, in terms of trying to address a few of these specific challenges. So I will give the floor now to Justin and Karen for their presentation, and I will be sharing uh, the presentation myself. So um, I will be waiting for your input to go ahead. Thanks, you have the floor. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Lorenzo and Dr. Mendez and Genevieve and Lucas. What an um, unbelievable presentation. Um, and a perfect description of the problem statement that Justin and I kind of walked into and what I know our governor and the legislature saw glimpses of with uh, past disasters when they decided to make a really important investment in what we call the Listos California Emergency Preparedness Campaign, a $50 million investment here in California. So. We're going to go ahead and get started, and um, Justin, my co-chair, if you want to go ahead and kick it off. Sure. Um, again, thank you, um, Lorenzo and team, for creating Luca, um, for creating space for this conversation at a time when California and our communities are uh, being impacted within, with this crisis, within a crisis, within a crisis, right? The global pandemic, wildfire, um, coming to light, um, historic uh, racism and oppression of communities. And uh, uh, we take a moment to, to have this conversation to hopefully inspire and motivate other um, actions um, that, that reach solutions. Um, I will say, um, you, you know, this work um, was one of the early actions of Governor Gavin Newsom when he assumed office in January of 2019. Um, as an action to invest in diverse, vulnerable populations, specifically around uh, disaster preparedness, and um, you know, give credit to where credits due. Uh, the report um, that uh, Dr. Mendez um, and his colleagues, uh, Genevieve and Lucas, walked through. The early findings were shared with Governor's Office to help create the motivation behind. Um, investing in a campaign like this, um, groundbreaking has never happened before in California. Um, and so we're really grateful for their work um, and, and ongoing um, um, echoing of um, critical um, issues that um, our communities need um, and decision makers need to 
um, address head on. So thank you. Next slide. And if we're able to play it, thumbs up, Luca or um, Lorenzo. If not, we can move on. That's okay. We can we can uh, share the link with everyone after. This is just more of our anthem to help ground folks in this what we're calling people-centered preparedness movement. Um, but please take a look at this when you're um, when you have a time when you have time, Karen. Yeah. So this is a quote from our governor, which really kind of tells you kind of where he's coming at this uh, from, which is a, a people-centered approach that he really wanted to usher in this new era of emergency preparedness. And um, and you'll see in the design of the Least of California campaign, embracing, of course, the vulnerable communities that we wanted to touch, which were defined as people in poverty, non-English speakers, people with disabilities, older Californians, um, and other diverse populations, and really wanting to hit those communities with important, targeted, meaningful disaster preparedness information, um, and at least impact a million of the most vulnerable and diverse Californians with this information but doing it in this culturally and linguistically um, sensitive and, uh, way that would make a, a real difference. Um, at the same time, wanting to leverage volunteer and service assets. And here in California, we have AmeriCorps, uh, we have CERT, a community emergency response team, which is a group of volunteers that are embedded with fire and uh, law um, that are great resource in communities. We have a program out of Santa Barbara called the Listos Program, which has been uh, grown because of this investment. Um, so we wanted to be able to leverage all of those um, assets in order to get the word out and educate communities, ideally beginning with a person-to-person -person education approach. But after COVID hit, that went more online, uh, more on Facebook Live, more <laughs> More on uh, with the other strategies that we'll be sharing, but we'll go to the next slide. And this is just more about our investment um, of how this campaign came came about. The fifty million dollar of um, state funds um, designed as local assistance dollars um, to really inject resources back into community, so that this really from its architecture and its the requirements of how the money is spent requires that um, that we work with community uh, directly on um, every aspect of this work, from our ground game and what it looks like to actually solve problems um, and helping to get communities more prepared for disaster, kind of changing the channel in our minds from victim to um, kind of a more of a first responder mentality of being able to be empowered with the information on knowing what to do before disaster hits so that folks, um, um, hard to reach communities are more able to um, not only protect themselves, but their uh, members of their community, their neighborhoods, um, the communities in which they work and live. Um, and so this really helped to motivate um, and give us the authority to really lead a very different effort that um, was community forward versus traditionally how efforts like this go, which is kind of through the systems of, of government from the top down. And so this is um, really advancing a um, community up approach. Next and slide. Add, oh. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, I'll, I want you to take the next slide anyways, but just so that uh, people can understand the structure, the $50 million was then given out um, it, through a competitive process. There's 58 counties in California, and 24 of them were able to receive funds through a competitive process to be able to build their own disaster preparedness campaign based on how they understood how their community would best receive information. You know, what were the assets in their community that they could lean on? Um, who were the right communicators? Who would be the right subgrantees 
um, that would reach the community as they looked at, at their community? Is it, you know, 20% people with disabilities, 30% older Californians? How many um, immigrants are they really trying to reach in their community? What languages and cultures do they come from? Um, these are the kinds of considerations that were um, looked at at the local level by the community-based organization that received a grant. And then that entity worked in partnership with the volunteer and service teams to be able to reach as many people as possible so that we could hopefully reach that $1 million goal. But I'll turn over to Justin on the research. So, you know, what we needed, knowing that we wanted to lead and really advance a, a community-centered approach uh, to this work and do something that has never happened before um, in, in California, we needed the data and the evidence and as much research and proof points as possible to um, uh, move our, our colleagues and, and everyone along. And it's been um, instrumental, both from uh, Dr. Mendez's um, research but also a lot of research that we conducted ourselves. And so where Karen and I are both sitting um, is here in the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and the State Operations Center, we're actually from the state level, the intersection between FEMA and local county emergency managers, um, the state plays a role in helping to coordinate emergency response. And so our campaign is here. I bring that up to say that we, one of the first things we did in working with our colleagues here is take vulnerability maps um, for every county in the state based on wildfire risk, earthquake risk, and flood risk. Those were the original kind of uh, staple um, disasters that this campaign was meant to solve for or boost preparedness around, um, and overlaid that with census tract data of the vulnerability indicators of the communities that we are intending to work with and serve so that we know for the first time in the state where diverse vulnerable communities live in every county in the state as it relates to their hazard vulnerability. Um, so this not only was instrumental for the ground game to help our partners that even though they know community and they know their communities and where they live, have more data on communities they, they, that they may not be as familiar with. Um, so they know how to target resources um, based on neighborhoods and, and um, other outreach and where to, to channel messaging on wildfire, earthquake, flood, we use this data on a statewide level to do and conduct some um, opinion work, opinion poll work um, through message testing, specifically um, phone surveys, um, uh, focus groups, and a poll um, to really understand what, what are the barriers of preparedness, what are the gaps, um, and our kind of ethos data points that we use to help guide whenever we're, whenever we're not sure what the right message is or the right strategy is the message point that we really use um, um, to help guide us is the finding that 88% of diverse and vulnerable Californians know that they need to be prepared. And in a state like California with as much um, uh, impact of, of climate change in the last 10 years of all the disasters we've experienced, like check the box, we know we have to be prepared and our communities know that we have to, that, that, that we have to be prepared, um, but they aren't getting prepared and they don't because of three key barriers because of um, they find that it's scary, time consuming, and expensive. And so that presented a big challenge for us in kind of taking the system as it always has been and redesigning it and reshaping it to address those barriers. Of course, there are substantial and significant other barriers that exist uh, based on the communities and their unique challenges, um, especially with this presentation of um, indigenous communities, um, you know, working um, as essential workers um, across California. And all the other older Californians, um, the, ref the refugee community, like all the other communities that we are really trying to connect information to. But at the end of the day, these kind of barriers of perception really became our guiding light. Aaron. Okay, next slide. So part of another thing that we was part of our infrastructure before we kind of kicked off the campaign was making sure that we developed a 25 member advisory team that really reflected the diverse communities that we wanted to make sure we touched. Hence, uh, my cop that Genevieve is a part of, um, their, their director is a part of that advisory. 
Um, and these are both subject and population experts. Uh, we also relied a lot on those community-based organizations that know their communities best. The best way to educate community members in Siskiyou County may be very different than how you do it in San Diego County. Um, and then offering our materials um, and all of our efforts with an eye toward the language diversity that exists in the 24 counties that were funded. That's why these were the languages that you see on the screen, English, Chinese, Filipino, Hmong, Korean, Spanish, and Vietnamese, were the selected languages given the concentration of people from the 24 counties. If we were to do this in all 58 counties, other languages would pop up. Um, also, depending on um, the effort we ended up developing, we're getting to that, a very special effort with farm workers um, because we, th this approach needed to be broadened, and we'll get to that in a second. Next slide. So part of you know our charge on this campaign has been to um, not only provide information that is um, both accessible in language, um, but also um, accessible culturally, and so. A lot of our work with um, both our community-based organizations, our service and volunteer teams, our advisory council members um, that include groups um, like um, MICOP and, and, gr and groups like um, on the Latino um, uh, Coalition for a Healthy California and other groups that are really helping us kind of shine a light, all are working towards the, this, this end goal, these five steps. So as I mentioned before, the barriers of getting prepared and there are substantial, um, we, we really are focused on advancing a culture of preparedness in which we are removing those barriers to start from an individual kind of community level. What can, what can a majority or what can more Californians do to get prepared um, that doesn't require a lot of money, time, um, and um, none of our information is uh, presented with images of fire and destruction and death. It's all um, hopeful, empowering, um, using artists to help um, and commissioning artwork that resonates with community, that makes it more culturally competent. Um, all the things that are needed to make sure that these five steps become more um, related um, and connected to the people that, again, we're working with um, and, and to serve. And so these are the five steps that are not the end all be all of being prepared and will not address the substantial challenges and issues that exist in getting many communities prepared, but in an effort that has never happened before and in work that is so desperately needed and we need to continue to make this investment and do this work, this becomes our, our, our first square um, to start to you know, change the narrative of what getting prepared is and start to work with communities more directly to get these five steps of which the last step um, becomes critical in continuing the conversation of preparedness um, from, from all the communities and, and the, throughout all the corners of the state. Karen. And I'll go through the next two slides really quickly just because I do recognize we only have about six or seven minutes left uh, before questions. Um, you'll see here kind of the centerpiece of the materials that we produce. This is the disaster ready guide. It folds in a really creative way. It's an eight and a half by 11, is in the seven languages. Um, and as you can see, really bright graphics, a um, lot of um, a real ease in really understanding what you need um, to do to get ready. We also provide curriculum, text curriculum, online curriculum, scripts in one hour, 15 minutes, five minutes. There's also additional materials that we've developed for in intellectually developmentally disabled folks for, um, and we're about to release a brand new uh, guide on our disaster farm workers and homeless that are coming up. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a little picture. It's hard to read any of the content, but this guide will be um, is in print right now, will be released this Friday at an event with over 5,000 farm workers in Mendota, California. Um, this is a disaster guide for farm workers that really helps farm workers better understand exactly how can they both um, be ready for COVID and for disasters um, with tips 
from coming home from the field. Um, it also has, for I think, the very first time as in a state document, the, a recognition, and this is a lot due to MICOP and other great organizations, that we have got to create, um, in this case, we created audio files to ensure that this was accessible to those communities, oh. indigenous communities that needed um, had oral language that just needed to be able to get out there. So there is um, a text you can um, be sent or it's ma making its way across community, uh, be able to enter in a number or just see a list uh, that's up on the right in the orange, you can't see this very easily here, uh, that lists your village uh, that you might uh, come from. And so you'll be able to recognize, you know, what, um, oral language a presentation you might want to listen to. And it's both for COVID-19 and disaster uh, preparedness. Um, I really can't encourage enough um, going to our website, the listoscalifornia.org website, because the Farm Worker Initiative is there, and that's where this guide is in both English and in Spanish, and then has the audio files, which also includes Punjabi, Hmong, um, and uh, other languages. Um, you see below it, people experiencing homelessness guide. This is just another demonstration of an, another niche, uh, vulnerable community group that needed very specialized um, support. Um, and so that's what we're going to be uh, producing and announcing in another week. Go ahead, Justin. Yes. So, you know, in addition to kind of our ground game and advancing the steps to get prepared using um, a uh, designed partnership with community organizations that know their community uh, first and foremost to um, actually reach the people um, and help get into those uh, communities that are um, experiencing, rightly so, you know, trust issues, other barriers um, and challenges um, to, to really um, help get to our goal of reaching 1 million Californians. Um, to help support that is our um, air game, which is the public awareness campaign that really helps, ad again, advance this cultural preparedness and kind of remove some of the traditional uses of wildfire, um, um, death, destruction, um, and darkness, and really elevate um, examples of people and community and art and cultural relevance and um, all the things that really speak to that. And as part of that, um, leveraging many, many uh, uh, events um, and media opportunities from, you know, in language media um, and in culture media, from ethnic media services that helps with our um, message being um, driven through API uh, publications and broadcast outlets to um, Spanish language um, media um, across the board. Um, California Black Media is a, is a network that we've um, been able to, to partner with to get into um, traditionally Black newspapers and, and radio stations um, and other outlets that really help us uh, kind of advance the message, and we're looking at more now to look at how we can reach even more communities. Um, and special initiatives, um, one to highlight is um, Informa Gente, which is, you know, a campaign that we've really partnered with um, the uh, with LULAC, the, the oldest civil rights organization in, in the U.S., kind of advancing the um, the needs of, of, of Latinos in, in the U.S., but also the National Hispanic Arts Foundation um, to help build partnership with um, Latinx celebrities, with um, state leaders um, from the California Department of Public Health um, to governor's office um, and others that can help uh, have a conversation in language to make information about COVID and disaster preparedness a little bit more approachable and accessible to folks. Karen? One thing I'll just mention, uh, especially given kind of the international interest, is uh, really vibrant partnerships that we have with um, the Consulate General of Mexico. Um, those offices work in, in partnership with us. We provide them with materials, both in, obviously in English and Spanish or what other languages they are interested in, and they go with us to migrant camps and we have distribution events. So that's just another example of a special initiative uh, that we unfortunately don't have time for all of them, but just so you have a sense of what, what we've got going. I'm going to go to the next slide. 
Um, this just tells you um, where we have our partnerships. Um, I'm going to go beyond that and um, keep going. Just see if we have time. And this just tells you the impact. Um, our goal had been 1 million, and we reached over 1.1 million with that very intensive um, education that we really wanted to have to make sure that people really understood how to be prepared. But in addition, when COVID hit and we had to pivot, um, we recognized it was really important to reach those same communities with COVID-19 um, education. And so that was another 11 million that we were able to touch with very COVID-19 specific information. Again, with the same pot of money, it's an 18 month campaign that has $50 million behind it, just so we understand the, the, the uh, numbers. And so as of right now, we're at 12 million. We'll go to the next slide. And this is really a call to just um, learn more about us and our work. And um, we have a variety of resources of information. One of the lessons that in, in our audit of just all the preparedness information that we conducted on the beginning of this campaign from um, kind of statewide work, local county work, um, national work and international work happening in disaster preparedness and, and really an effort to build resiliency. We noticed that there was either um, too much information uh, that um, it was a lot of private consultants or entities that required you to sign up or pay um, for, for information, or it was disjointed. It was not presented in a way that was designed to be accessible um, for an individual to could be um, to enter into a training themselves or to be able to have the information and the curriculum and presentation materials to conduct the, their tr a training for their community um, and have all the information and resources and guidance to be empowered to do so. So we really help to, we think, um, kind of uh, disrupt the preparedness world a little bit and making all this information not only accessible to information into uh, to individuals, uh, the text curriculum that Karen mentioned that's on our website, the web-based curriculum that's also on our website, but also to make, um, to empower organizations, whether or not they've received funding, to be able to access our presentation materials and our curriculum and our guidance on how to lead a conversation that is both simple, straightforward, but also motivates behavior change um, making it all available and accessible on our website. So we hope all, all of you um, listening here um, can take, take some time to, to, to look at our uh, materials and information and, and um, see how you can um, integrate it into your work. I think with that, I think we'll wrap it up. And I think our final slide just has our contact information once again. Or should, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much once again for this opportunity. It really is an honor to, to be a part of this great community. We look forward to any questions that you might have. Yes, thank you. So thank you both for opening this fantastic Actually, to read All the type of all these work that you have to do in terms of evidence based approaches, everything that has to be supported through participation, engagement of community organization of community representatives. That is really uh, truly fascinating and, 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 and really interesting work. And a really an example of how uh, this type of inclusive communication can, can be shared. Um, so, um, Exhausted our, our presentation, and I think we have already received um, a couple of questions through the chat box. Um, and we have a couple of questions in particular from Wendy Identity. First one being from Lady Lucas, um, and she's asking what do all the employers in community and providing a safety net for the documented migrants they employ? There's a second question for the panelists, um, and it's about whether you feel support systems that are offered by your organization are sustainable to be captured in community. Uh, um, if the number of migrants as well becomes higher and more diverse, so and, and the other sustainable under the future, and what kind of 
and those things to prevent by stem more sustainable. So these two questions are role of employers and then um, sustainability of the program. Let me just repeat that question because, uh, uh, Lorenzo, unfortunately, you're coming out, uh, at least on my end, uh, muffled. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the role of employer uh, of the employer in reducing the vulnerability and providing a safety net for uh, the undocumented migrants they employ? Whose responsibility is their safety and welfare currently? So perhaps I'll let uh, Lucas and or Genevieve uh, tackle that first. Sure, I'd be happy to help answer that. Um, uh, you know, I think in an ideal world, an employer's responsibility would be to provide paid time off for workers uh, during a natural disaster. I think we know that's that's not the case um, for for the vast majority of the workers that, that we engage with. Um, California did pass a uh, a workplace protection standard. Uh, Cal OSHA uh, is now now enforcing a standard that requires once the air quality index reaches 150 um, or that unhealthy level. Um, for employers to uh, provide uh, uh, safety equipment, the respirator masks, um, but we also know that there's very limited um, enforcement of that in reality, and it really uh, depends much more on a complaint-driven system where vulnerable workers are much less likely to, to file complaints about violations. And within, within that aspect of the violations, it, as Lucas mentioned, it's complaint-driven, and under uh, current data, uh, CalOCHA, which is the Office of Occupational Health and Safety, the statewide office, um, current data shows that only there's only 26 field uh, inspectors that speak Spanish. So that's for the entire state of California, and remember, we're a population of 40 million people, and uh, that's only Spanish, so no data uh, uh, listed are, do any of those field operators speak in this deco. So just to add to that, I think one thing that we've consistently asked of Cal OSHA is to not let the employer know ahead of time. Um, so, for example, when we see just like every day outside of natural disasters, right, the everyday issues of dirty bathrooms, unclean water, um, typically Cal OSHA will let the employer know so they can clean it up like hide their dirty laundry, and then the next day it goes back to business as usual for the farm workers. Um, I think under COVID in particular, what we're seeing in terms of who is responsible for these workers, there's a, um, they're passing the ball. So it's either they pass, the employers pass the ball to public health, public health passes it to the employers, to the agriculture commissioner. Um, so there's no real um, accountability or enforcement of, of, of much, um, and I'm talking more along the lines of like social distancing at, at the workplace, mask wearing, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's kind of like everyone's pointing their fingers at each other. Uh, us as advocates, we're pointing fingers at everybody, and um, that's just un the unfortunate reality at this moment in time for our farmers. And one last note, I've been doing some uh, initial uh, interviews with advocates in Northern California where the fires are happening in, in what you may know as a wine country of California, Napa and Sonoma. Sonoma in particular, the Agriculture Commissioner issued uh, nearly 400 uh, access verification permits. These are, uh, uh, these are permits that employers ask to allow workers, uh, outdoor workers, to end their mandatory evacuation zones. So these are mandatory evacuation bills that are considered hazardous, that maroon color that we see in the air quality index. Uh, that's hazardous for the general population, but they're asking for these permits uh, for uh, outdoor workers um, uh, in hazardous conditions and mandatory evacuations. So it's unclear if the agriculture con uh, commissioners at the local level are, are speaking to air quality management districts, public health officials, and of course, first responders such as fires. Uh, so it's important to understand that. And then when we decide about uh, to allow these workers to enter into these these, uh, these hazardous field sites with the hazardous air quality, is proper uh, PPE, uh, N95 respirator masks being uh, given to these uh, individuals. In some cases, it, I've been told that it's uneven throughout the state, so there's no uniform enforcement. And as well, um, there's, there's difficulty in understanding how they decide it reaches that harmful, unhealthy air quality, because much of the air mo monitors are stationary, and many of them are miles away from the actual work site that these individuals are, are working in or where the access permits are being granted. So there may be a need to uh, more handheld uh, air quality sensors, which are called purple air sensors, that can uh, give real-time exact air quality measurements on the actual uh, work sites that they're requesting permits for. Thank you. If I could just add a comment on that. Um, 
just because one of the interesting effects of MISOs in this has been people that have been involved from the community-based organizations that are not affiliated with farm workers who saw in Napa and Sonoma people going back to work, right, in the fields and feeling completely mortified. How can they be doing that when the air quality was so poor? So calls were made to the governor's office complaining about this. We found out that the permits were approved by the local sheriff. That's the entity that has the, 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 you know, the authority to approve those permits that you speak of, Dr. Mendez. And so that is not an individual that necessarily has been given a protocol to check on air quality, et cetera. Um, the N95 masks may have been given to employers, but the question is there, there's a lot of protocols about um, and um, challenges about how those N95 masks have to be put on and training that is required so that they're um, worn correctly and um, otherwise there's um, a legal implication. Um, so there's reasons why farmers are not distributing the masks because of that, um, that, that challenge. I just say that because I think we're starting to kind of unwind you know, all of the legal uh, challenges that people have out there, um, and, and we've got to keep, keep getting more people involved in this, along with the important critical activists that are at the heart of this, and the farm workers themselves, we've got to get a larger community to get involved in caring. And when they do, they can make a lot of additional noise. Thanks for time. Uh, do, are we able to go a few minutes over to respond to that other question that came in the chat? Yes. Around yes. Um, so, so I would I would say that I think we already saw with COVID nineteen the way um, some of those systems uh, are are not sustainable. The creation of the eight hundred five undocumented fund in our our area um, that was really overwhelmed by the massive need of the pandemic. Um, and I think you know you can. I think this really speaks to it's it's a it's a policy change that's needed around inclusion of everyone, uh, regardless of immigration status, into our safety net, um, and figuring out how to make the unemployment insurance work system work for everyone. And even when you look at the um, unprecedented, uh, you know, funding that California gave out uh, for disaster relief to undocumented folks, it was you know five hundred dollars of a one-time payment um, to a you know a, a fraction of the undocumented population in the state. Um, you know, that was less than most people were getting every single week who had unemployment insurance. And you can imagine, you know, if you're un unemployed for months, how far $500 really stretches. Thank you. We also have a few other questions that have come in, so I will just read it out and address it to the panel panelists. So uh, one of the questions that we got from Joanne is, uh, in terms of when Genevieve was speaking, um, uh, I think uh, there was a mention of uh, how social solidarity or community work was being recognized by government and they're increasingly consulted. So the question is uh, to understand uh, the role of local or regional authorities, uh, how much are they being, how much they are being involved in this now that uh, such networks have been more recognized. So I think we'll go to any of the panelists who would like to understand um, to comment on it. I can start off with that, and, uh, and Gen Genevieve can um, uh, uh, also assist me with this. And I, I'd like to um, acknowledge that yes, uh, local governments. This is a, a learning process. Uh, these uh, we're in a current climate uh, emergency, climate change uh, crisis. California, Australia. Um, and, you know, small islands are at the forefront of these climate impacts, and it, it's a learning process, and we're all adapting. And local governments um, uh, don't have the resources um, or the know-how or didn't invest uh, ahead of time in some of the disasters. So we see a patchwork of um, uh, enforcement uh, and uh, development of protocols, as Karen mentioned, and I'd like to thank the, the governor's office and taking a lead and, and trying to create uniformity. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a strong process, and, and Karen also mentioned, and Genevieve and Lucas, is this strong political pressure um, that these uh, social organizations, these coalitions that are developing, uh, engaging with uh, legislators in the legislature, such particularly uh, those of Latino uh, and indigenous descent that are also uh, being allies and also developing and creating audits and creating new programs and temporary disaster relief funds 
such as in the governor's office that uh, issued um, earlier for COVID-19. So it is a process. We have a patchwork. Not some some counties are doing better. Uh, Ventura and Santa Barbara are, are much better than they were three years ago because of Genevieve and Lucas. Sonoma and um, uh, Napa are, are are there as well. Are, are well, there as well? But much improvement is still needed, and more uniformity uh, is needed in, in developing these uh, protocols and the policies. Genevieve. I would say the only thing that I would add, you know, this has been a learning for us. I mean, I certainly did not get into nonprofits to do the disaster relief work that we've been doing. But I think what we're seeing, right, is, you know, there are going to be uncomfortable situations. There are going to be uncomfortable conversations to be had. A lot of, you know, what we've done has been because we have relationships with certain entities, right? And, and, and since the Thomas fire, we've developed new relationships with new entities. Um, but that's not to say we're going to agree all the time. And, and I think we, we also just need to remind ourselves that ultimately we're working for uh, and to support, you know, the same community. Um, but, but like I said, we're, it, it's not always going to be eye to eye. Um, and we have to recognize that and, and name that those uncomfortable moments. Um, I think the other thing that's coming up for me is in, in terms of being involved in certain um, certain policy development or whatnot is to also make sure that whatever decision making entity is involving a group like my cop or a group like cause that it's not tokenizing. Um, I feel like uh, more often than not in certain spaces, you know, we get invited and we just check off a box. Oh, well, we, we, you know, my cop's here. And, and, and really if my cop was there, where was my cop's voice? Um, was the space accessible? Um, cause for a lot of ours, so, for our organization, a lot of our staff are, are bilingual, English, Spanish, Spanish, Museco. So a lot of our meetings are in Spanish. So truly, if I were to bring some of my colleagues into some of these spaces, could they even access the space? Um, because they are community, you know what I mean? Um, so these are questions that, and, and thoughts that we're, we're pushing our partners. Um, um, and, and again, it's, it's finding the comfort and the discomfort, right? Um, but ultimately, our end goal is to support the same community throughout these disasters. I would just add to that, you know, this idea that when we think about disasters, so many of us think about response efforts and recovery. What happens during, what happens after? And what we're really trying to do, at least as California, and the question about how do we integrate um, groups and work with community more is if we can get more entities that are working with community to focus on resilience and, and what's needed before disaster strike, what are the conversations and fixes from the top down, bottom up that we have to solve for before disaster strikes, um, it, it's gonna it's gonna uh, put us a lot further faster. Um, you know, our kind of um, thought process is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work happening to um, invest in the kind of economic health, kind of political civic engagement space of community, but what is the point of those investments in that work if communities can't survive? the effects of climate change. And so really helping to um, at least do what we can with our with our campaign to to create that space and really help motivate that um, both within government, but also um, help connect the dots for communities that may not see disaster preparedness um, so front and center. Uh, thank you. I think we have uh, two, three more questions that have come uh, to us, so I will just address it to the panelists uh, quickly. Um, one is, uh, I think this is uh, something Lorenzo himself has written in the chat box, which is that when we were developing the Mickey guidelines uh, itself, uh, there was concerns of how undocumented workers uh, could have access to uh, government-initiated uh, uh, assistance. So, uh, was that apparent uh, in uh, your work as well? And uh, what measures do you think can help address them? Uh, this is mainly to Genevieve, Lucas, or Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely concerns from community when accessing um, any assistance from from government. I think especially since we're living in the time of, uh, you know, public charge, folks, like, it's so unknown and, and it's so, like, um, you don't know what, what falls under public charge and what doesn't. Um, you know, we we saw with the um, the Thomas Fire, you know, when, um, I forget what they're called, like, I think recovery centers were, were popping up in community. A lot of our folks weren't going there. Um, and they were, they, they had folks, they had volunteers and were ready and willing to, to receive them, but our, our folks just weren't going. 
um, I'll, there's a, a sentiment in at least the community that we work with of like, that's not for me. You know, I wasn't impacted by the fires. I didn't lose a home. And we had to do a lot of, well, but you were impacted. Like you lost work, you know, you, your kids had to stay home. So your grocery bills went up. There, there were real impacts that our community members weren't seeing. Um, I, I think the governor's office was very smart when they rolled out that $75, $75 million um, dollar, uh, pot of money for undocumented folks to, to collaborate with community-based organizations because we're the folks on the ground. Um, my organization has been in Ventura County for 20 years now, and so that, that trust is built in. Um, when, when us and CAUSE you know, created the AdocuFund with our partners, um, there was that sense of like, are you government? What are you going to do with my, like, and we had to say, no, we're not government. We actually didn't know us. Um, so there's a comfort in knowing that, you know, it is a nonprofit versus government. Um, but again, to Lucas's point, it's, it's not sustainable for us. And so how can we co collaborate with government to make it more welcoming, more friendly, um, to have them have staff that speak the languages that are from community, um, to, to have that, that more like hand, like closer touch. So to, to get rid of that fear. Yeah, I'd like to add, yeah, uh, thank you, Genevieve. And this idea of uh, public charge or federal authorities, uh, uh, such as immigration authorities, coming in and deporting these individuals really creates fear of, uh, and suspicion to access disaster service, uh, services, particularly shelters, when they're entitled to, to access those shelters. Um, and, and about 12 years ago, and, and, and the fires in, in San Diego County, which is uh, the most southern, uh, one of the most southern cities in um, the state of California, you have immigration uh, officials at the, the um, uh, shelter. So that created a lot of fear and people not going to the shelters. Luckily, uh, we were in a very different political environment in California where that's not existing uh, as much. But also in terms of federal, federal disaster relief funds, uh, and undocumented migrant, of course, is, uh, we all know it's not eligible to, for those federal funds, but if they live in a household with a U.S. resident or a U.S. citizen, what they call a mixed household, they're eligible uh, for uh, disaster relief assistance for the entire household. But what's happening in the recent fires in Northern California, uh, the, the federal government, because, uh, because of the existing political environment in D.C., um, has a disclosure uh, there that, that, from what I've been told, um, that the information may be shared with Homeland Security. So there's this fear or perception that even if you're in a mixed household uh, that, uh, and you're eligible as a U.S. citizen or resident, but people living with you that are undocumented, if you get that assistance, then the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, federal government, ICE, uh, the Immigration Service, is going to be able to track you and maybe use for deportation services. So there's a lot of fear and perceptions, even when a household is eligible for some of this assistance. I also just want to add a quick comment about what I think we have can just be here to confirm what you're um, sharing in your experience. Um, and, you know, as people who work for the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, this agency, the mission here is to protect life and property. And if you look at these fires, although there's been some loss of life, which has certainly been tragic, it hasn't been a large loss of life. and it. They, they try to protect property, but that's typically people who can afford to own property. They aren't looking at people who work in these communities who may or may not own their property, right? They're not looking at, uh, they're not, I would argue, they haven't yet chosen to look at um, the entire community, right? And that's why it's it's been set up the way it's been set up, which is to to be there to prepare people that um, come from privilege as opposed to people that are from all elements, right, of a community. And um, I know that this effort is just hopefully the first of many steps. And I think we are seeing in this governor's office someone who really does get that the community-based organization, the my cops of the world, are the ones that are trusted by the community. And if we care about the people of California, wherever they come from, that, that that's really our charge is to protect the, the people. So I just want to share that thought. Thank you, Karen, uh, and the uh, other panelists. And we have, uh, we are taking our last two questions right now. Um, this is addressed to the panelists uh, by Sarah Rios. Her question is regarding the agriculture 
agriculture industry. Um, there are disasters before COVID-19 uh, that uh, and wildfires such as pesticide drift and valley fever that exacerbate the economic, social, and housing disasters of California. But it seems that we have not addressed the agriculture industry itself. What can the agriculture industry do, or what has it done to address wildfires in terms of adaptation or preparation and their impact on farm workers? It's generally addressed to the panelists. So. I can start, and then if anyone else wants to jump in, I think what's fundamentally needed is a cultural shift in, in the agriculture industry. Um, you know, what we see is, you know, there are policies put in place, you know, at the top level, but what, what gets put in place at the top, once you filter it down to like a, like a supervisor, my normal for leader to the workers, it's completely different. And, and I think we just need to be better um, at, at how can we, fix that gap and fix that disconnect. Um, I know in Ventura County, we have a program called the Farm for Resource Program, um, and they have done some incredible work to, to try, not to, to the cultural change, I think that's a little bit too radical, that's kind of where we step in, but um, you know, as a government entity at the county, you know, they're trying to bridge that between growers and between, um, and between advocates and the actual farm workers themselves. Um, and, but I think that's, that's why we haven't seen Seen that I think a lot of what I hear from growers is, you know, we're overregulated. We, why does it need to be punitive? You know, um, the workers don't want to wear the masks. Um, kind of to, to Karen's point, like there's these legal implications if the mask isn't worn right, so the growers don't want to incur that. Um, but I think there, there needs to be that cultural shift um, to how what what gets decided at the top gets disseminated up to the workers. Um, and, and more than anything, I think, you know, we have these little fix-it bandages put in place, but really, you know, we need the industry to pay a livable wage to our workers so that they can afford to take time off during, you know, wildfires, so that they can afford, you know, health care if they get sick and they're not waiting until they're literally dying to, to get care. Um, so those are the kind of cultural changes that I think needs to happen in the industry. Um, and, you know, we do have allies. Um, we do have, you know, the good players, as I like to call them. Um, but it, it needs to be a lot bigger than that. Yeah, I 100% agree with Genevieve around the cultural shift that's needed. Um, even outside of a disaster, farm work is one of the most difficult, deadly, and dangerous jobs in America. Um, and and the, the, the person asking the question spoke to some of the, you know, other respiratory problems even before, you know, wildfire smoke and, and COVID of, of, you know, exposure to pesticides, you know, dust, and valley fever. Um, you know, there, there are so many health risks, and a lot of this is, is also driven by structural issues. Um, the agriculture industry in recent decades has really shifted to become much more uh, kind of segmented with layers of contracting and, and, and subcontracting, um, you know, uh, farm labor contractors, you know, distributors who are different from producers, um, and this allows some of those folks at the at the top of that industry to, um, you know, maybe have less responsibilities and obligations for um, for who's directly employing the workers. Um, but it also means when when kind of a, a Driscoll's is putting out information, um, you know, and putting out the guidelines for for their producers, their producers are making their own decisions, and those producers are, you know giving uh, information or guidelines to the actual supervisors throughout the field. And as, as Jenny spoke to, it's, you know, sometimes it's English speaking, you know, agriculture, uh, you know, uh, managers and, and landowners uh, communicating with Spanish speaking supervisors, uh, communicating with indigenous language speaking uh, workers who are actually on the front lines. And so there's, there's a lot that can be lost along the way. Um, uh, there's also the structural issue of, of both the extremely low wages and kind of the insecure employment and, and piece rate pay um, that makes it so that, that workers really have a, a, a strong necessity to kind of work hard and fast even during a disaster, um, you know, are not able to to kind of have that that kind of economic security year round. Um, I think that's a that's a major, major issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think there's a lot more that, uh, you know, companies could be doing to really prepare on the front end, you know, having those stockpiles of, of respirator masks ready, um, doing the training before a disaster even happens, um, getting rapid response systems and information into place. Often, you know, you have to look up on an air quality website, on the, you know, on your local air district website on, or on airnow.gov what the air quality is. You know, those supervisors in the field are not at laptops able to, you know, 
um, to you know check the the air quality. Someone needs to be getting that information out to them. Um, and so uh, there's there's a lot of kind of structural changes, but a lot of it really is is cultural and around the idea that you know even at the beginning of this this webinar we we spoke to like low skill jobs that are kind of considered you know uh, to be you know low paid or you know not have that kind of same respect. But I would say agriculture worker, you know, if anybody on this on this webinar right now wants to go out in the field, you'll find that this is not a low skill job. It's an incredibly difficult, incredibly complex job um, that should be compensated for for how how difficult it is. And you know those those workers need to be treated much better even outside of disasters. And um, thank you, uh, Lucas and Julia. I'd just like to add, yes, it's, it's a cultural shift, and uh, this very issue is uh, the basis of, of the, my continuing research on exactly how are uh, the ag industry, agriculture uh, uh, sectors speaking with other sectors such as public health, um, uh, air quality, and how are they developing disaster management plans, particularly if they're issuing access verification plans. Are these large, uh, particularly large employers, are they creating their own emergency plans ahead of time? So that's a basis. If this are continually disasters that are happening, and knowing that um, these individuals are going to be working in hazardous conditions, that growers themselves, particularly the large ones that have the resources, should have their own disaster management and emergency plans for their outdoor workers. And the other compounding issue that we also are very aware of outdoor workers is heat waves that California is continually happening and drought. Um, so it's been a continual pressure. Uh, the Community Water Center has been really at the forefront of issues of drought that have primarily affected migrants and undocumented migrants in the central part of California. And so these are multiple uh, avenues that social uh, movements are putting political pressure for structural change. California um, has been a leader in trying to address these things and passing legislation to address um, the drought and provide uh, affordable and safe drinking water uh, to residents in these agricultural regions. Thank you. And I think we are on our last question so that we can wrap up uh, before we overshoot on time. So this, the last question is addressed to uh, Karen. Uh, so the question is from Michael from Brandeis University. Mm, he wants, uh, his comment is, it seems like most of the weight falls on the hands of the workers. How do corporations who own the land be made more accountable? Also, do workers have a reporting hotline where they can report such incidents? And uh, do workers have lawyers and translators to represent them legally to possibly get compensation? Um, I can speak to some of this, but I think also others can speak to this as well. Um, um, here in California, there's um, the ALRB, the Labor Relations Board, that um, does get and um, puts out, I think, some very helpful materials that tries to educate workers about their rights, which include, you know, up to 80 hours of leave should they come down, let's say, with COVID or other um, illness. There's other rights that are um, articulated in their brochures, um, and we are in the process of working in a, a heavy partnership with them to get that material out. Um, in some cases, I think it's growers that um, don't know the rights and don't make it their business to know the rights. In other cases, they know it and uh, don't think I think they'll get caught, um, if I had to be guessing here. <laughs> um, there's a lot of other players too. They can, um, you've got not only the workers, you've got um, the kind of the middle, the middle men and women, um, you've got the growers themselves, you've got ad commissioners, some of which rely on great partnerships with CBOs that they trust. Like I know that's the case in Fresno and Madeira, where they will give N95 masks to the CBOs to distribute to workers. Um, as opposed to in neighboring counties, those ag commissioners will only give them to growers. You know, so it's um, it's really interesting to see how it's implemented very differently across the board. And I think that's the kind of big cultural shift that everyone's kind of leaning in and talking about. There, there just has to be a more consistent um, understanding that that you know farm workers need to be at the table with growers at some point as these rules, as these regulations, as these guidances are produced to ensure that it's workable um, and how will it be really implemented 
because it's in the implementation that everyone takes it in so many different directions. That's at least my perspective. Um, some people are well-intentioned, some are not. Um, I'm not here to judge that. I'm just to say it's just not being done in, the, in what I perceive to be a very kind of thoughtful or consistent way. I'll turn it over to Genevieve, who may have some comments on this. Get over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, Lucas. We've lost him. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think there there's real challenges in that. You know, the agriculture industry and advocates and government are often, you know, starting in a place that's very far apart. There is, you know, some level, I think, of, of hostility among, among certain leaders in the ag industry of feeling that they're, uh, you know, over, over regulated or being, being blamed. Um, but ultimately the, the responsibility does lie with them to, to collaborate um, and to, you know, start these collaborations early. I think we've had some, you know, success in, in Ventura County, um, you know, around things like creating this, the farm worker resource program. Um, you know, we're, we're actually starting conversations right now on creating a, a text rapid alert system for um, wildfire smoke for, um, for workers. Um, but, but I, I do think that we, we need to get over, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, un unwillingness, I think, to to examine, um, you know, flaws within within the agriculture industry of, of folks who feel like everything is, is an attack or kind of a broad brush stroke, you know, saying everybody's a bad actor. I think, you know, not everybody's a bad actor. There are actually real, you know, complexities to actually, you know, uh, following some of these uh, worker protections. Um, that, that I would for sure acknowledge, I mean, it, it can be difficult to get, you know, rapid information about, you know, the constantly changing conditions of wildfire smoke. There are, you know, barriers to communication and training, um, you know, but if the, if the response from industry is, is always a no, you know, you're attacking us, we don't want to, you know, um, we don't want you to, uh, to be putting more restrictions on us, um, then we're never going to solve this problem and, and industry is going to continue to be kind of you know, seen in a bad light by, by, by media and the public. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would add, and I, it's not wildfire specific, I think it's COVID specific because that's kind of the world we're living in right now, um, at least, you know, at the moment. Um, you know, for example, there's um, these agriculture advisories that have protocols in place um, in Terry County, at least in the Barber County, I think Monterey County as well. Um, but they're just guidelines. There's a hesitancy to be like, this is what you need to follow or else, and, and I don't know if that's from a single person, kind of, kind of what you're saying, Karen. Like, you know, good intentions, bad intentions, um, but there's, there's a hesitancy to say, no, this is what's required. There's a hesitancy to, to have that kind of leadership to say, this is how we're across the board going to be protecting our workers. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to offer that as well to this conversation, just within the context of COVID. For some reason, there is that like that not want that the, the again the hesitancy to not. Put something to paper. Like it's a guideline, you can follow it, but we're not going to regulate you on or, or it. Or it also ignores, in my mind, some of the just kind of the real reality of the power relationship. So That's N95 right. masks um, are required to be provided by workers who request them. But what worker who 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 may not feel comfortable with the grower requesting um, an N95? Right, like, what about that? You know, so like, it, it does that need to be worked through a different way? You know, um, so that's what makes it complicated, I think. And I'd like to add too um, the role of the university. The university is a has a important role to play. Karen, I'd be happy to, and just happy to talk to you about this. The uh, University of California has ag uh, agriculture experimentation stations throughout the state of California, primarily in the agricultural areas, and their charge is to uh, engage on uh, innovations and education around agriculture to farmers, uh, farm workers, and residents in general. So that could be one avenue of uh, how do we create proper training of a maybe a, a neutral party outside of the government um, or, or a, a nonprofit that can help educate some of these growers and farm workers themselves about their rights and the use of N95 masks as well. So that's something that probably offline we probably could talk more about. 
Great. So just really quickly, that in Ventura County, we've piloted a program for supervisors, um, and that's through the Farm Worker Resource Program. Um, whether or not, you know, it's been evaluated, whether or not it's been, you know, impactful, I, I'm not too sure, but that, that there is a pilot out here. Um, so things to, to, to be worked on so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I want to offer that too in terms of training. I will just say really quickly, speaking to political will, I mean, I think, you know, with this governor coming in, um, Governor Gavin Newsom, and, and fostering an environment in which more people are asking the question, how do we reach community in a better way? How, what, who are the CBOs and the partners on the ground who are doing this work? I know Karen and I are, um, you know, re regularly asked among our colleagues, um, what's the best way um, and strategies to reach um, older Californians or um, API communities or kind of farm worker um, indigenous communities. Um, we are by no means an expert in, in those communities, but we but we do know how to work with community um, and help connect the dots. And so um, just from this vantage point, I will say it's a really um, positive and um, hopeful moment with so much interest. I think now it's upon both government, um, private sector, CBOs, uh, pri uh, public sector to, um, you know, not let this moment pass us by and, and kind of double down on the work um, to make sure that we're um, creating systemic change, not just riding a wave of the moment. I wanted to, to um, add a little bit to Karen's point around uh, power dynamics, and I think that's absolutely so true in, in the field, in, in the workplace, uh, the power dynamic that prevents reporting and, you know, and asking for the safety precautions that are needed. I think it's also really true in government, where in a lot of our rural counties, uh, you know, in California and across the, the country, the agriculture industry is the single most politically powerful entity, and migrant farm workers are the single least politically powerful group of people. Um, and, it, and it does require a willingness, I think, on the part of, of government in time and crisis right now um, to be to be willing to, uh, you know, take a stand on, on the side of folks who are, are not very politically powerful, um, you know, often, you know, challenging and contesting the political power of those who are um, and say, we're going to do what's right here and, and we're going to, to work to make this this solution happen. And it, and it may create discomfort. But as, as Jeremy said, we have to become uncomfortable with discomfort in order to adapt to this kind of crisis. Thank you to all the panelists. I am going to pass the mic on to Lorenzo for closing. Going to check whether you can hear me this time? Yeah, yeah. Heard them before? All right, great. So thank you so much. Thanks for this discussion. We are 30 minutes over the time that we had allocated, and I feel we could go on and on. And there are still 50 people online that are listening to all of you. So this really was uh, fascinating, interesting in terms of both understanding the complexity of the challenges that we're facing and some potential uh, responses. I mean, of course, uh, beyond all the technical interventions that we can deploy in terms of inclusive disaster risk reduction. There are these structural issues that you have, um, all of you have mentioned, that need to be addressed. Uh, the, the, the migration policies and immigration enforcement, the, the, the way uh, economic and, and political representations interplay in creating vulnerability for these specific groups of people. And of course, the, the 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 thing that you last mentioned about how important a conducive environment at, at the policy level it is to really be able to do this groundwork for a successful um, inclusive disaster risk reduction. And um, I, I really like um, to close on two points that you um, highlighted throughout your presentation. First of all, that these cannot be issues that we tackle in isolation. We need to consider the specific vulnerability of this group alongside many other groups that are part of our society and that might share some elements of this vulnerability. Right? And migration status intersects with so many other elements that might result in exclusion and marginalization to people in disasters. We might not be particularly better by looking at these conditions by themselves. We might create even more marginalization if we focus exclusively on migrants. And the program that Justin and Karen, you described, actually is a great example of how you look inclusively at all the different components of society. And, and the other thing is, I think what Lucas was mentioning about uh, how we have this perception that this is low-skilled work, that these are um, people that 
um, basically are, are not necessarily recognized for the value that they provide to communities. I think this is really a point that we need to keep in mind as we go towards the recovery from the pandemic and, and, and when, when we think about other disasters as well. We have recognized the essentiality of these workers and the contributions that they give to the society. We need to extend this thinking to all the, the contributions that migrants do for our societies. So it goes beyond this work that is essential for this crisis right now for the survival of communities in the face of COVID. We really need to think long term about the variety of contributions that we get from the presence of migrants for more sustainable, resilient and interesting and vibrant societies. So I would really like to thank you all for these uh, contributions to all the attendees for taking the time and remind everyone that the recording of the webinar and the materials that have been shared, the presentations will all be online. And um, again, I, I wish you all um, a, a good rest of the day and I really hope that this was useful and um, I, I really thank you again all for, for your participation. Thanks and have a good rest of the day.